This is Beyond Busy. I'm Graham Alcott. I'm the author of a number of books, including the global bestseller, How to Be a Productivity Ninja. And I'm the founder of Think Productive. We help people to make space for what matters and get more done. And we partner with some of the world's leading companies who share our mission to transform the world of work. Beyond Busy is where I explore the often messy truths and contradictory relationships around topics like work-life balance, happiness and success, and explore with interesting people what makes them tick. In short, this is where we ask the bigger questions about work. My guest today is Oli Kassel. Oli is a social entrepreneur based in Denmark and the founder of Cycling Without Age, a global movement bringing together volunteers to provide cycle rides outdoors to older people who would otherwise be stuck inside. He's also spent a lifetime experimenting with different ways to bring kindness into the world of work. And in this episode, we talk about his journey creating Cycling Without Age and growing it to become a truly global organisation, the importance of intergenerational conversations, his experiments in slowness, why kindness is good for business, and how his dad inspired his playful spirit. I think you're going to love this one. This is Oli Kassel. Oli, how's Copenhagen today? Copenhagen is rainy today. You are the founder of Cycling Without Age. Um, it's an incredible organisation in terms of just its reach around the world and just feels like it's really captured people's imaginations. Do you want to just tell us the story, first of all? What is Cycling Without Age? Yeah, I can do that. And and maybe just to explain some of the background. Um, so I come out of a family with a dad who suffered from MS, which is a terrible, terrible disease. And, and back then, they couldn't really diagnose it properly. Um, and so he was very quickly in a wheelchair. And so actually, I know firsthand how lack of mobility can cause social isolation and loneliness and depression. Um, so, I, I, you know, for, for several years, my mm. dad really suffered. But actually, it, it brought me closer to him as well. And, and then, you know, when I grew up, um, of course, I had all that in my baggage. And, and some years ago, I just became acutely aware that I didn't really see many old people in my neighborhood. Um, and those I did meet, they, you know, would just be sitting on benches outside their homes or the care homes. And there was one particular guy who just uh, caught my attention um, and spurred me into action. And that was a, a, a man that I later, you know, later really changed my life because I started, uh, I, I offered bike rides to him. Uh, he was in a care home. And it, it just brought me an, an amazing insight into a, a different generation. And it gave, it gave me a lot of, um, of joy to be able to take this, this man uh, back on a bike and get him back into his neighborhood and, you know, meet his old friends, uh, see the old places and listen to stories and so on. So I felt it was a really wonderful um, two-way thing where I was able to offer my companionship and he was able to offer me a lot of stories and a lot of insights and wisdom from uh, from his age. And then, uh, you know, it, it, uh, it just, you know, continued on from there with, um, uh, you know, with the, the city of Copenhagen, getting involved and uh, sponsoring some trishaw bikes, you know, these uh, uh, wonderful three-wheel bikes with uh, a double seat in front. And and then it just grew from there. It grew to all the, the care homes and uh, activity centers in Copenhagen and beyond. And it's, it's since spread to most corners of the world as well. The first time you had that conversation, that first person that you took out for a bike ride, like, tell us about that conversation, because obviously then it's like you're a, are you a stranger at that point? Like, are they having to take a big risk on you? The idea that you're not going to just uh, kidnap these people or something like so that first making it happen for the first time. Well, I think because uh, actually the, the, the gentleman I just referred to, he wasn't actually my first passenger because I, I showed up at the local care home with a rented uh, rickshaw, as I called it. And um, and I took this lady out for a bike ride. And um, and of course, the fact that I was even allowed to just turn up yeah. at a care home and and offer my services uh could have not happened if it wasn't for the fact that they they trusted me and so i think there are a lot of things that can happen uh in society if uh, if there is a an abundance mm. of trust and um i have a feeling that we're going to be talking a lot more about trust uh, later on as well but trust what it is what made this possible 
And so I, I took I took this uh, this this wonderful elderly woman out for a bike ride, and uh, and she took me. She was kind of my guide, and she took me all around her neighborhood of Copenhagen and showed me all the sites that she knew from her childhood and her youth. And and then so she stopped basically nonstop for an hour, and then I I, I took her back to the care home, and I I dropped her off, I helped her inside, and I. Then I I met the the care home manager and she said to me that um, that, that was uh, you know uh, commended me and said it was a wonderful thing to do and I said well you know actually I got just as much out of it because you know she stopped non nonstop for an hour and then the care home manager said well she doesn't really talk so <laughs> that's really surprising and I guess that was also the first time that I realized that these bike rides they have there's something magic about them because it can get people they make people really chatty. And it's a wonderful way to to build uh, relationships through conversation, um, and so that's what I understood. There was something magic about it. Whether that was the you know the fresh air, the companionship, the sights, uh, the smells, whatever it was, there was something magic about it. And I want to just talk to you about the guiding principles um, that you have on your website. So, the g- generosity, slowness, storytelling, relationships, and without age. Um, and I'm just going to pick a couple out to talk to you about. I, w- I want to know more about slowness. I, I love talking about slowness because um, it is always very surprising to most people that, that we have slowness as a guiding principle. But um, to me, slowness is um, the, I guess it's really the prerequisite for having meaningful conversation that you can slow down and you can, and you take your time to listen and you just basically roll along. So it's about the speed of the bike ride, but it's also about, how you take yeah. your time. And it's, it's also uh, an opportunity to use your senses. Uh, because I think in, in this day and age, um, things go so fast. And, and particularly elders don't really understand why it has to go so fast. And I, I think most of us, including myself, we can get stressed out because we're under so much pressure and we have to perform and we have to do... Uh, so many different things, you know, we have kids to take to school and assignments at work and all the rest of it. So I think slowness is is, is, is almost like a forgotten life yeah. principle, I think, that most of us have forgotten about. And so I think by incorporating that, it also uh, just allows people to um, feel that it's okay not to hurry up and not to have to, you know, get things over with in a, you know, in, in just like half an hour, but that you really take your time and don't really worry about the time. So I always encourage people to, you know, to, to book a time slot that is much longer than they really anticipate so that if something happens, then they can just go along and, and not feel they're under pressure. With the idea of slowness, like now that it's one of the guiding principles and because, because you're talking about it, have you noticed any, any changes for people just around how they're, how they're seeing time and how they're seeing just the idea of slowness. I think so. I um, I, th- I think just the fact that we talk about it, and I, I, you know, I don't want guiding principles to be like values in in, in some companies where it's just something yeah. you put on the wall, and then uh, you know everybody can see it, and but you don't really know what it means. It has to be meaningful, and there has to be conversation about it. So we have um, we have a lot of sessions with uh, volunteers, both online, offline, on social media, and so on, where we talk about the guiding principle. We kind of put one of the guiding principles up and we we ask people what it mm. means to them and i think just having that conversation about slowness um gives people an opportunity to really dig deeper and find out what it means to them and i've heard i've heard many wonderful stories about how uh being slow has led to chance encounters you know uh that you know you go so slow that uh you can stop and chat to someone who's uh, walking their dog, and then you find out by having that conversation that that is someone that uh, you know whose parents you knew back in the day. So I've I've had that particular uh, yeah. incidence, and so I think uh, it's um, it's a little bit actually. We were the other day we were discussing about how we were as an organization impacted by COVID nineteen, and of course because we deal with vulnerable people, um, we were we were shut down almost instantaneously across the world. Um, and but because we have our guiding principles, people were able to say, well, just because we can't offer bike rides, we can still live our guiding principles. 
and offer conversation and offer, uh, you know, lend an ear to someone who wants to talk. And so really just to have the time to sit down and listen to someone. So I know that there are thousands of our volunteers who grabbed the phone and had phone conversations with, uh, with some of our passengers um, and then didn't actually take them for a bike ride for over a year because of COVID-19. And I think if we had just been about offering bike rides, uh, the whole thing might have just stopped and never restarted. But because we had the guiding principles, that's what people connect to. And I think that's the, that's the very fabric of what we're all about. Is that something that you were um, particularly keen to promote? I mean, obviously with the bike rides, but wanting to maybe just change how society views that idea of intergenerational dialogue. I think intergenerational dialogue and relationships is crucial because I think it's, um, it's the only way that will allow us to understand um, what p- other people are like. And I think um, the, a good breeding ground for, for, for mistrust in society is that you don't interact with people who are different from yourself. In, in many different ways. And, and certainly generational gaps is probably one of the, the, the biggest gaps and it's not really talked about. Just like ageism or age discrimination yeah. is not really talked about and is, is still sort of generally accepted in our society, which I think is, uh, is, is terrible. Uh, you know, we, there's so many things that we've, uh, we've agreed now that we cannot discriminate on the basis of, but, but still age is, is, is still so widespread uh, in our society. Yeah. But the benefit of doing um, of of, of uh, mixing different generations is is profound, really, because when 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 we when we do see the world from someone else's perspective, and particularly someone who has had a long life experience, we can harvest the most amazing um, pieces of wisdom, these little nuggets of wonderful ideas and. Uh, insights from from uh, an era where, like we talked about before, things weren't as fast. Um, people had more time to think about things, to contemplate, to uh, come to conclusions and so on, rather than like in, in this day and age, things have to go so fast. And and so I think it, and, and what, what I really also believe is that with these conversations, we are able to build these wonderful relationships because you know, you don't just build relationships unless you take the time. You invest time in uh, engaging in dialogue with someone else. Um, and of course, you know, you don't make a friendship with just about anyone that you meet. But I've certainly, I, I would say that uh, over the course of the last eight or nine years, I have made probably uh, a dozen of really close friends that I would have never met because. They are anywhere between 30 and 50 years older than myself. If you think about those, those relationships, is there like one thing or a couple of things that you really treasure that you've learned from those people? Yeah. I mean, there, there are, of course, there are many things, but one of the things I really think is, is, a, is a true little um, uh, life hack is, so my, my friend Tokil, he's, he's the guy who sadly passed away a few years ago, but he was a ripe, nearly 101. Um, he always, you know, he celebrated every single day and has celebrated every single day. I think he, he learned that from his mother. He was just a very uh, cheerful bloke. And um, he said that there's no point in holding a, a grudge or... Um, or um, of being angry, I think that maybe it's the right translation from Danish. Um, and then he used a word that I completely forgot about. I knew the word existed, but I don't think many young Danes really fully understand the words uh, now. But it's spelled P-Y-T, and it's, it's, uh, it's pronounced put. And it means uh, to let go or to say never mm-hmm. mind and to just accept that, uh, okay, this happened. I can't do anything about it. Um, and then just basically move on. And I think we have, we, you know, certainly I've, I, I, and I still do so, but you know, I'm, I'm trying to also, uh, listen to talk you, but not to, uh, get hung up on, on little things of, over which we have no control. 
And I think there, there are so many of us and, you know, we get engaged in a conversation on social media or we meet someone uh, and we have uh, something happens that we can't really do anything about. And we just keep uh, pressuring ourselves and, and it, it affects our mood and affects our health. But just that little tiny word, put, just means, you know, just let go, just yeah. move on. Because, you know, it, it's not going to increase your quality of life that you're going to spend the next couple of days worrying about this or, uh, you know, looking at it from different angles. Of course, we have to learn from things. But sometimes there are things that you just need to let go of. And I think that was, uh, that's probably the, it's, it's, a, it's a tiny thing, but it's still so profound. And I, I really cherish that insight. There's something really poetic about how short that word is compared to all of the emotional weight that often goes on behind the idea of giving these, you know, giving something up or, or sort of coming to that realization. And actually because it came from uh, a, a person with yeah. so much life experience, it, it feels like it's, it has, it, it carries so much weight that if he says it's okay to do it, it means that I'm allowed to do it. And then when I say put, then it, it does actually go away. Right. I wanted to ask you about kindness and I read somewhere um, that that you'd written about um, your parents having a very interesting approach to kindness and uh, kind of experimenting with random acts of kindness at home. Um, so let's start with that. And what does kindness mean to you? I think kindness has to come from something that is selfless and altruistic. Um, so kindness can never be something that is calculated, um, that you're trying to get something in return. Um, and of course, so, so I think we all do things from time to time that we do, we do it because we expect something in return, but I think, um, real kindness has to come from within. Um, and, and I think it actually, you, it's, it's, a, it's something we can train. And so I, of course, because my dad was, uh, was into, you know, doing random acts of kindness big time, I got to, uh, I got to experiment mm. and train that yeah. muscle when I was a kid. So he was in a wheelchair. We would go for, for, for walks where I would push his wheelchair. And then we would come up with all kinds of different things where we could um, make people smile. And so it was very much centered around how we could make people smile by either doing slightly foolish things um, that would make everyone smile or laugh, or we could actually sometimes help people as well with just tiny little things. And what I also learned from that whole experience was that it doesn't have to be like massive undertakings. Can you give us some examples? Like it's just those tiny little things. I'm really intrigued by the, yeah, I mean, by the foolish things. I remember things. there was one time, well, there was one time, so, so imagine, so my dad is in a wheelchair. He's paralyzed from his chest down. So he can't really do anything. Uh, so he's completely... Um, uh, relying on me and, and around that time, I must have been maybe around 11 or 12 at that time. And, and then so we go for a walk along the, the riverfront in, in our town. And, um, and it's a kind of a, a little nature area. So there aren't that many people. So he says, you know, uh, Ollie, can you just park me here and just, you know, go and hide in the bushes. And then I knew something was going on. Right. So, and then I said, yeah, yeah, sure. So I hide in the bushes and then like a few seconds later, this uh, couple walks past and he says, um, uh, excuse me, um, I'm just wondering, you know, my, my friends, uh, my friend parked me here um, and was just wondering if it's okay to cross the river right here. Is it too deep for a wheelchair? <laughs> and so these people were first, you know, in complete disbelief that this man in a wheelchair was, was contemplating crossing the river in a wheelchair. And they were like, no, 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 you shouldn't do that. And then, you know, he, he, he carried it on for a couple of minutes. And then in the end, he, he just burst laughing. And then they were <laughs> bewildered. And then they laughed as well. And I came out and I laughed. And then we could just see them walk off. And then they were killing themselves <laughs> laughing over that this had happened to them. So it was just, it was a crazy thing. And uh, we, we, we laughed. And of course, you know, many, many years later, we're still talking about this episode. And I wonder if that couple, they're still talking about it as well. But, but 
so so there are all these wonderful little things and I, I've kind of carried that with me all my life. When I was a teenager, I would also do it with my friends. We would sometimes do slightly more elaborate things, but it could, it all, always, um, the intention has been to, to just create a smile without too much of an effort, but that we're not expecting anything in return. So when you do something like that, you make someone smile, but, but it, it's not like someone says, well, now you make me smile and I have to do something in return. It, it just comes from uh, the fact that you understand that you have, you have brought a smile to someone's face, and that is, is a wonderful feeling. And, of course, as all research shows as well, when you, when, you, when you produce a smile like that, then that spreads because the chances are that those people who have been affected, um, they will be just a little kinder to uh, the next person, and maybe they'll do something you know, nice to someone else. Do you have a favorite little thing that you can, you can do in a public place that you know will always bring a smile? Well, you know, I uh, so my, my my girlfriend and I we um, uh, we we like to do things that can you know will just make people turn around and look at us. And one is, for instance, uh, one that we did. Um, uh, I think it was last year. We were on a on a, on a train station. Is she will stand and um, and I will um, walk towards her, and then um, I will pretend that I'm actually saying I love you to someone else, but I'm actually saying it to her who's behind that person. <laughs> and then to see that person who thinks that I am telling that person that I'm in love with them, and then I, I walk towards them, and they panic for a second, and then I just embrace my girlfriend, and then we're there and <laughs> just <laughs> enjoying the moment. Uh, we do silly walks sometimes as well, and, you know, it, it's not going to – I don't want it to sound like I'm doing this all the time, but it's 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 amazing, you know. What, one of the things I've always um, cherished is the fact that my dad gave me this uh, ability to bring this little tool with me wherever I am. So you know, it's it's it doesn't take up any space. It's it's purely in your head, and you can do all these wonderful things. If you can just imagine how you can make someone smile, uh, you can come up with like a million things. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I encourage you to uh, to just try it out. Okay, so I'm going to interrupt the podcast, which you know I don't do very often, and that must mean I've got something very important to share with you. So what I want to share is I've got these two really big events coming up, and I would love you to join me. Do you have... A version of that or do you have a little bit of that kind of anarchic spirit in the way that you manage people and lead a team and and sort of interact at work so if you take that spirit from the train station like does, does that translate through to how you work with people i i think so i i um so i i like to 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 bring play into into the workspace as well i think uh i think it's important that uh that work doesn't feel like a, like a soul drenching place where you just have to sit and work like a treadmill, uh, but that it feels like it's a place that you can you can truly be yourself and um, that you can you can fail you can you can laugh you can um, step out of your character. So, um, like for instance, a lot of what we do is involved around uh, onboarding uh, new volunteers, onboarding new affiliates uh, to set up chapters. And so we spend a lot of time telling them about, um, for instance, uh, just very, very simply, you know, the bike that we're using. Uh, you need a little bit of training. You need to understand how, you know, the, the brakes operate, how to do a safe turn, all the rest of it. And it takes anywhere between 15 minutes and several hours, depending on um, how much experience. But that could be done in a really dull way but it can also be done in a way where you're actually you're making people smile and you're making people curious and so on so so it's 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 about telling people fibs sometimes as well that we're telling them something that isn't really true sometimes and then waiting for them to figure it out um <laughs> i remember one time there was one volunteer saying to me but but now you told me something that isn't true and how am i supposed to know what is right and i said well actually now you you're really going to remember this now because now we've uh, you know we've 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 had a conversation about this so you're really truly going to 
know exactly what I'm what I'm saying here. You it, it, you're probably going to internalize it much better than if I just said it in a dull voice. So, so we, we do sort of fool around a bit when we, when we train people, uh, of course, making sure that they, they get to learn all the, the ins and outs. And how but the brakes work. You don't want to be too foolish with how the brakes work. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but but there, I, there has to be an element of, of playfulness. Um, I think that is crucial also for people, just the way people um, perceive things, and oh, sorry, how people take things in and how they, they learn things and truly um, take it on board. I think playfulness is, is really important for that because it, it also increases people's motivation to, to learn things. I mean, we all know it from our teachers at school, right? It was usually the ones that were a little bit playful that, uh, that we loved the most, and they were the ones that we learned most from as well. Um, let's think about the, um, this idea of random acts of kindness and experimenting with kindness. So... You were telling me before that you've done um, various different experiments around kindness and and thinking about how you lead with kindness. Um, So, yeah, let's just start like really openly with that. Um, What's your relationship with kindness as a leader? Maybe I can just explain one of the one of the little experiments that we did a couple of years ago that I I thought um, also gave me some insights that was came as a complete surprise to me. But um, but we wanted to see some because sometimes you know telling people that uh, they can they can lead with kindness and they can use kindness in their work very often it's difficult to tell them exactly what to do i mean i don't want them to just do what i do i want them to find their own way or their own angle or um whatever suits them and so that's where the autonomy comes in you know you need to give them hand over the keys and say this is what you can do, and I trust you to do it in, in the way that you feel is the right way. And and so I, I decided that this was going to uh, I, I was going to to uh, to do a little bit of experiment in an area that uh, I thought was so different from from um, the business that I was in. So the friend of mine who owns a, a very small chain of uh, of uh, artisan bakeries, and a lot of the people working there, there are young students and. Very often, young students aren't really the, um, um, I guess, the the most uh, engaged or loyal employees. You know, they they really dare to um, just make a like a salary for uh, for maybe being a student and uh, and paying for the rent. Uh, so it's it's not a career choice for them. But I wanted to find out: is there a way that uh, we can incorporate kindness there as well? So we 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 sort of. Uh, just sat there and, uh, and 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 kicked a few ideas back and forth, and then came to the uh, conclusion that well, why don't we just allow people to give away free goods exactly the way they wanted to do, and and not um, telling them how we want them to do it, but they can do it themselves, and and not really putting any limit on it either, and to see basically can we trust them to make the right decisions and not ruin the business. So we did an experiment with one of those. So putting no limits on, so they could theoretically give away everything that they're about to sell. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, they could. And so, so we uh, we we call in um, a group of uh, employees. Um, so so there were there were several small bakery shops. So we wanted to see that if there was a difference, right? So um, so one of them, we we call in all the um, all the employees. I think there were like twelve in total, and we talked about this and said, you know, from tomorrow. Uh, we want you to always give away something, but it's up to you what you want to give away and how much you want to give away. And, um, and of course, um, just bear in mind that uh, we still have to stay in business at the end of the week. And so what, what, what we found was that, that you know, they, they worked themselves out different strategies. Some just wanted to get things over with earlier on and just you know almost like the first few customers they would get some free stuff others they kind of kept it and some were very particular about um giving it to people that they felt either needed it because they looked like maybe they couldn't afford uh to buy to buy bread um and others if they felt that they had been particularly kind so you know someone comes in and is is cheerful and uh, lighting up the atmosphere then they would give it to them and um, and then, so we, we carried it on for a month 
and uh, we kind of observed how much was given away. And actually, the average amount that was given away by each employee was something the equivalent of, of, of 10 pounds per day, which was nothing. And how do you measure that? Because obviously it's not going through the till, or did you have a till setting for... Yes, yes. So we, we could, uh, we could uh, pull out a report afterwards. And, um, and then we sat down with them at the end and said, so what have we learned? You know, what, what do you think about this? And, uh, and th- there, were, there were a couple who said, uh, oh, that was interesting, but uh, nothing more than that. But, but the vast majority said that uh, they felt it was so interesting. Some said it was, um, um, that it was very hard because it really made them think, who should have this bread and, you know, should I develop some criteria? But above all, it, um, it made them far more interesting in their job. And so they become far more engaged. They suddenly, it wasn't just about handing over bread and taking in money and, and making, you know, a monthly salary. This was far more about understanding people and being interested in other people. And so we actually found that, uh, that suddenly the, 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 those young people working in the bakery, they suddenly knew much more about their customers. They would engage far more in conversation and they would actually, we, we measured also their happiness at work. Um, so, um, so we, we, we took some, uh, some, um, some, some standard tests that, uh, and asked them to, to rate, um, their happiness at work. You know, how do they, how, how did they feel about going to work every single day and how that changed over the course of the month. And there was a very significant increase in the way they felt about their job. Um, so the emotion that they, uh, attached to being at work for four, six, eight hours, um, had had gone up very very significantly, just by basically showing them the trust and saying you can you you do this but you do it your way, and then let us know what you feel about it. Like there's so many things happening there, right? So when you so there's lots of research that says that if you perform an act of kindness, then your brain is releasing dopamine, which is the reward chemical. And oxytocin, which is like the love hormone, and it's and it's uh, bringing about uh, more trust and and empathy, um, and it lowers cortisol, which is like the stress hormone, right? So, like, if you think about what's happening in in the in someone's brain as they as they give away that bread, like, of course, because that's happening at work, they're going to feel more connected to their work, more connected to their colleagues, more connected to the job. You know, it, it's just going to have so many positive ramifications and what a simple thing and on top of that you're also it's a really nice way really simple way to just demonstrate trust in them as well you're giving them autonomy you're giving them the trust to figure out the way to do it i i I just i love that experiment because i think it was it was so simple and but it also um and actually very importantly like you said it's about trust and it's also the in order for this to work, it's also the willingness of, of, of leaders and managers to release control, to let go of control. Because I think, um, I, I don't know what percentage it is, but it's a very high percentage of leaders uh, and managers in companies around the world who are, um, who are desperate control freaks and uh, who, who want to micromanage almost every single activity that goes on in, in, in the company. And when you look at it, like autonomy and the ability to make decisions that impact your own work is one of the most important factors of happiness at work and job satisfaction. So if, if, if you feel that uh, you can't make any decisions and that that's going to impact your, your, your quality of, 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 of life very, very significantly. So, so that is a huge barrier. It is to overcome this, um, this uh, desire to control every single action in a company and just basically let go. And this was, of course, um, this was a big deal with this one because we we basically said to people, you can, you know, there is no cap. Yeah. You yeah. can give away the whole bread shop if you want to. But nobody did because when you show people trust, they mm. reciprocate. So, you know, trust breeds trust. And it may sound like, a, you know, um, a cliche, but it's uh, it is so true, and I think I have seen it 
happening over and over again. Uh, people will not abuse that kind of trust. Is there anything else? And maybe there's, you know, maybe you can bring this back to some of your conversations with the friends that you've made in different generations as well. But is there anything else if someone's listening to this and they feel like they are a bit of a control freak or they um, get very stressed by the idea of relinquishing, relinquishing control? Is there anything you can say to them that you think might help? Well, I, I can say this, that I, uh, I wouldn't say that I've ever been a control freak, but I've had periods of time where I've had the inclination to be more controlling than others. And, um, and, you know, I have three daughters, so there are times as well that as a parent, you, uh, you, you experiment with being uh, a little bit more controlling than at other times, but I would say in general, I'm, I'm, I'm very relaxed about control with the, my upbringing, but it, I've had times. And what I find is that uh, my, uh, my stress levels, so my cortisol levels in my body go up very, very significantly when I am the controlling daddy. Whereas, uh, you know, when I'm the, uh, the daddy who is not just, you know, I don't just let go and, and you know, say, I don't care, you can do whatever you want. But essentially, uh, it's your decision. I'm going to be there all the time for you. I can um, um, give you good advice. I'll always be there, and I, I am very interested in what you're doing. That's not do too dissimilar to what happens in a company and, and with a leader. And so what I would say to those managers or leaders who are uh, maybe, of course, they really realize as well that they might be control freaks. But if you feel as a manager that uh, that you need to let go a little bit, um, then just think about um, the you know how it you have a, like a tight knot in your chest if you are controlling, and how wonderful it would feel if you could release that by simply just letting go and um, and and showing trust to other people. So um, so just experiment a little bit. Um, I'm very fond of experiments at all levels. So um, experiment and then feel in your own body what it feels like when you release control. Um, and I, you know, certainly from my, from my own perspective, I can feel it almost instantaneously in my entire body when I do that. I, it's, it's just a wonderful feeling. And of course, you go from having lots of cortisol all around your body to, like you said, dopamine and oxytocin, that uh, flows instead because now you're doing something like the complete opposite. So, you know, you're obviously having a complete different cocktail of chemicals in your body than you did uh, when you were the controlling person. Cool. What people can do to just encourage the people around them to show more kindness and to be more playful. It's, it's a very good question. And I, um, I'm always a little bit mindful of, um, coming in on the high horse and telling people you must do this. Um, I'm, I'm far more into uh, just um, inspiring people. And so um, just going back to um, all the, all the, the, the releases of, of chemicals in our, in our bodies when we, when we do these kind of things. Um, so um, what, what actually happens is that when people witness someone doing a random act of kindness. Even people who are, of course, on the receiving end will also um, feel an emotional elevation. But people who are yeah. witnessing that uh, random act of kindness, even if they're not involved at all, will also experience a very, very significant uh, increase in their levels of, uh, of happiness. They so, call that the Mother Teresa so effect. I, I, do, you know that, do you know about that one? Yeah, I heard so that, yeah. There was this... Uh, neuroscience experiment where they showed people like a uh, like 45 minute video 50 minute video of mother Teresa doing all these different acts and then they measured people's stress levels and all of those hormones that we talked about the levels of that in in their bodies and yeah that was what they found it's just like witnessing this kindness which is happening on a screen between two people that you don't know still has that effective emotional ele elevation yeah yeah absolutely so I, I would I would actually say Graham that um, my advice would be not to um, not to tell people that uh, this is what you need to do, um, but to simply just engage. Not even just saying you know look at what these people are doing, but actually experimenting yourself. So as a both as a colleague, 
as a friend, as a as a leader, a manager. Um, I think the the very best way to promote um, kindness in all aspects of life is simply just to to yeah. live it yourself. Yeah, uh, and it it needn't be massive things uh, like we talked about um, initially. Um, it can be just tiny little things um, because even tiny little things can have an amazing impact because it will spread. And so um, I do just like sometimes I talk to people and they say, well, you know, I, I, I could never start like a global movement, but you don't have to yeah. because I didn't set out to start a global movement. It just, you know, in this particular instance happened to lead to that, but it all started with a tiny little random act of kindness that was uh, selfless and altruistic, so expecting nothing in return. And if if that first bike ride had just been that very first bike ride and nothing else, it would have still made a difference to uh, at least one other person and those people who witnessed it yeah. and myself. So I I think it's just a matter of uh, of uh, telling ourselves that every single little tiny act of kindness is very very important. What I'd love to hear, because there might be people listening to this who think, yeah, that's great. Maybe I can pay the parking meter forward for someone because that's always the, the cliched thing. Do you have a few other little tools in your toolbox like that, um, maybe particularly in terms of work, that bring a smile or spread a bit of kindness? Like What are, what are, the, what are the little tiny ones that, that you do regularly that you really enjoy? I mean, it's. I think in our, in our office, we very often also uh, just do little. Uh, and again, sometimes it's a. Uh, it's it's kind of related to the secret uh, the mm, secret Santa yeah. that you have in, around the world. Uh, kind of, we we do that every single day of the year. So we we kind of encourage people to be a little a little crazy uh, with each other and do little uh, things uh, that it, it can it, it it's it's never even borderline bullying at all, but it's uh, it's teasing <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> so basically, you know, if if, uh, if if it could be anything about like uh, just um, uh, putting a drop of something in someone's water that it tastes slightly differently and, uh, and just uh, seeing the person having a strange reaction. And then, uh, of course, it's all, uh, it's all um, uh, in, in, in good spirit and we all end up group hugging, hugging and so on. But it's just about bringing out the emotions and, 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 and letting people know that we care um, and, and to not be too, um, you know, self-righteous about things or uh, even to uh, like take things too seriously that this is, you know, we have to do this. It has to be fun. It has to be playful. Um, and, and it can involve the element of surprise. Mm. Yeah. I think actually very yeah. often it does, you know, involve the element of surprise. Um, but it has to be, it has to be tiny little things. I don't want people to feel they have to go out and do a big, you know, uh, spiel and, and, and set things up. Of course, I don't mind about that either, but it's, it's those tiny little things that only take like, uh, 10 seconds to, to think out, or even some, sometimes it's just the, the spontaneous things that you just think of and then you, you act on them immediately. Um, and, and those kind of things spread as well. Um, and if they are all tiny, then everybody can can engage and everybody can do it. But yeah, I just think all those all those things that um, don't necessarily cost a lot can end up being, you know, actually just the most valuable things as well. Exactly. And 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 on that point, um, so we live in a world both in the private sector and the public sector of key performance indicators. Everybody has a set of KPIs that they have to um, fulfill. And if they don't, then it has consequences. Um, and we, we, you know, companies put a, an amazing, huge amount of of, uh, of effort into producing all of that. And this is what you should be focusing on. But I've never seen anyone talk about uh, like uh, random acts of kindness or little weird things or crazy things that you can do. But in terms of employee engagement, they are far more important and th than, than, than any key performance indicator. And so I think, you know, most companies are actually, they're spending their efforts in the wrong place because those other little things that we can do, they will increase our 
you know, engagement and our desire to go to work and our happiness at work tremendously. And then you'll actually end up having a, a company that is, is performing much better because people are happier. People are staying longer and, uh, and not quitting. So I think, um, and I, I, I've had so many conversations with CEOs from so many different companies who like the idea, but when it comes to actually taking the plunge and uh, trying to put their efforts elsewhere, uh, very often it is it is uh, really um, fear provoking for so many leaders to get away from what yeah. they know, um, and they can just sit and measure to going into something that you know honestly is about um, allowing people to show they care, and they you know it's it's about love. It's about kindness. It's all those different things of the the things that uh, tie people together, and that creates this uh, amazing sort of cushion of trust in uh, in a, in a company in our world. It sounds like you've got all of these things that don't really cost very much in terms of time or resources. They make a huge difference, and yet there's a fear that's holding people back from actually putting these things in motion. So how do we overcome that fear? <laughs> well, I think uh, like we've, we've, we've talked about, um, I think, uh, you know, maybe we should, um, we should encourage leaders and managers because they're the ones who are stopping this from happening. We need to encourage them to do these little random act of kindness and to be a little crazy, to dare be a little crazy and a little weird um on a on a daily basis and allow others to be so as well because that's that's how it's going to grow there's there's no other way i want to just ask you one other thing before we finish which is um so you mentioned your dad and his ms and um i think you also have uh another member of your family who has a disability as well and i just wanted to ask you just generally about how you think we deal with disability when it comes to work and obviously you've been around that I have a disabled son. So I'm also uh, interested in your perspective on it. Um, but yeah, what do you, what do you, when I say to you disability at work and dealing with disability at work, um, what do you think the current climate for that looks like and what do we need to do better? Well, I think we've, we've certainly come a long way. Um, I know my own dad already had um, the ability to do um, work where he was, he was manning phones and using his mouth. So already back then, there were you know there were opportunities, and I think we've we've come a, a long way um, in for, for this to happen. Uh, and certainly, I think uh, people with disabilities um, have come further than um, that elders. Um, so I, I still think discrimination based on on age is far more uh, widespread now than uh, discrimination based on disability. Wow, that's but yeah. I. I I will say is that um, we should celebrate diversity in disability more than we do today um, because we do have a tendency to see people, um, we see people and their disability. We don't see very often the person behind the disability. And, and so I think if we can get to the point where we actually celebrate that as, as a, a, almost like a, like a superpower. So, you know, very often, uh, if you look at a superhero, it's very often because they've lost another ability that they suddenly have developed a superpower, right? So if we can, if we can celebrate all the diversity and disability by um, pinpointing those areas where they can make an extra contribution and celebrating that, I think that would be wonderful um, if we could uh, make that, uh, not, like weave that into our, in, into our culture. Um, and I think we can all, every single day, we can all do that. We can all um, uh, spend far more time with uh, people who are different from ourselves because that will also increase our level of empathy. And it all, it, these are all muscles that we can train. Um, and then if we can just, uh, again, go back to celebrating diversity. That'd be my best recommendation. It feels like there's two things in there. Like one is, like I'm really fascinated by neurodiversity in particular. And, you know, when you read the list of people who were either on the autistic spectrum or 
um, you know, had had other conditions which just meant their brain was just wired a bit differently. It's like everyone from, you know, Elon Musk in the present day back through to Einstein and Beethoven and and beyond, right? And it's like so many of those people, even up to the present day, it seems like they managed to achieve in incredible things despite the system. And so if you could change yeah. the system so that actually you could really uh maximize those people's talents rather than them have to fight against the system the whole time to let their talents come through it's incredible what humankind could achieve um in 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 that sort of um environment but then the other thing on the other side of that is um just that whole celebration of diversity that you talked about um we don't need to see everything as being about high achievement right so actually just celebrating diversity is also a really good way to to slow down and to kind of see the the sort of broader range of human experience beyond just mere productivity too, right? So it's kind of both both ends of that spectrum. Yes, and then be curious about uh, what it's like. I, I mean, I, I visited one of our suppliers a couple of years ago uh, of, of these uh, trishaws, and there were a whole group of, uh, of, of blind people um, assembling the wheels with the spokes. Um, and so I sat down and, and have a kind of conversation and I tried to help them out as well. Um, spend an hour uh, learning the trade of putting in spokes in wheels. And I realized how bloody hard it was and, and how really good they were and what a fantastic time they had sitting there. And so um, I think sometimes it's just a, about um, finding out a way to... Um, to uh, really get under the skin of someone who has a completely different perspective, um, and uh, but 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 really kind of immerse yourself into it, and I think we we can all do that. And and certainly when I take elders for bike rides, then you know I sometimes feel that uh, you know we're we're time travelers and we go back in time, and I get to really understand why elders very often will say certain things. That um, that may come as a surprise to 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 uh, to the untrained eye, but if you're in that, if you immerse yourself into that conversation and you you really get to understand and listen to them and to the, to listen to their perspective, then you grow as a human being as well. You get this broad perspective of of insights, and uh, uh, you know, and and it, it that that kind of in, in inclusion i think is probably the most important thing that we can all do on a daily basis and that broad perspective of insights i mean i feel like that's what i've been given over the last hour so i just really want to say thank you for um having this conversation with me i just feel like i've learned so much and i could just talk to you all day and um, before we finish um tell everyone where they can connect with you and find out more about cycling without age and anything else that you want to share. Well, first of all, Graham, I think this is a wonderful conversation. And I, I, I love these, uh, these kind of uh, thought provoking conversations. So um, it, uh, I really enjoyed it. Uh, people can get in touch with, uh, with us on cycling without age.org. Um, we also have a UK charity called cycling without age. Um, and you can go to uh, .org.uk. And we're looking for people who are interested in getting involved in all different levels. It could be a volunteer uh, as a pilot to ride the trishaws or to organize rides. Um, but also, if there isn't a chapter in your vicinity, then you can also become uh, an affiliate and you can start your own chapter. And you can find information about that on, on the website as well. So we just, you know, we welcome everyone. Fantastic. And it's a great organization. So if you're sat there with a little bit of fear and trepidation but a bit of inspiration i would encourage you to get over the fear and dare to be playful ollie thank you so much for being on beyond busy thanks Ryan. this video is sponsored by think productive home of the productivity ninja we help people and organizations to increase their impact and make space for what matters through a range of workshops programs and coaching head to thinkproductive.com to find out more are you interested in booking me as a speaker for your event? You want to sign up for my Rev Up for the Week email? Do you want to buy some of my books? Or do you just want to find out what I'm doing right now? It's all at grahamalcott.com forward slash links. And if you like this video, please like, subscribe and share so we can make more. Thanks for watching.